Welcome to Cities on the Move. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. The U.S. Air Force is looking for new recruits. We'll meet Staff Sergeant Thaddeus Cook and learn more about why he chose to enlist. Later in the program, we'll learn about a long-standing youth organization, the Boy Scouts, from one area family. And finally, we'll visit the Quarry Hill Nature Center in Rochester, Minnesota. Blending science, exploration, and fresh air, they are helping area nature lovers learn more about our natural world. We'll have all this and more. Stay tuned for Cities on the Move. Staff Sergeant Thaddeus Cook is responsible for finding good candidates for the U.S. Air Force. Let's find out what made military service an important part of his life. My name is uh, Staff Sergeant Thaddeus Cook. I'm the Air Force representative for Southeast Minnesota and parts of Northern Iowa. My job mostly is Air Force recruiting, um, bringing Air Force awareness to Southern Minnesota and finding qualified young men and women to uh, join the Air Force or maybe look into it and see if we can help them out with their goals. I've been in for a little over eight years, so um, it's been pretty good. I'm on my third enlistment, and I plan on making a, making a career out of it. Um, it's been great for me. It's where I met my wife, and uh, it's been a great career. I, I love it. Doing this job, this job uh, as being an Air Force recruiter, um, it's nice because I, I help young men and women, you know, make life-changing decisions um, and for a positive change in their life. And that's been awesome. You know, when you send some guys up to uh, the military entrance processing station, and they come back and they're all excited for the Air Force and, you know, their, their life's on the up. It's, uh, it's a great feeling. It really is a, a pride factor. Mostly we're looking for young men and women who are between the ages of 17 and 27 of good medical and moral character and who have at least a high school diploma. I would say uh, what recruits should think about is, is their life goals. Um, really, you know, try to figure out what they want to do or, or some kind of th something along the lines of, of their goal. And then talk to a representative and see if, you know, the Air Force would be right for them if it could help them out with their goals. You know, if they come in and they're not sure what their, goal are, their goals are, um, you know, we'll sit down and talk about it and, you know, say, hey, you know, what are you looking for in life? What, you know, what do you want to achieve? That kind of stuff. And they usually, you know, after talking about that, they usually kind of come up with it on their own. One of the most common questions that I'm asked is how long is an enlistment? Um, the Air Force offers a four-year and a six-year enlistment. One of the other questions I'm asked is, uh, what are the educational benefits of joining the Air Force? We have a couple different things that really that really help out. Um, while you're on active duty, we have 100% tuition, uh, which is just that uh, the Air Force will pay up to 100% tuition for your college, um, whatever college you're going to. Usually it's the local college around the base. Then we also have the Montgomery uh, GI Bill, which just changed actually to the post 9-11 Montgomery GI Bill. And with that, the, after you do your four years and you get out, the Air Force is going to pay for your college, uh, pay the tuition for your college for 36 months. They're also going to pay uh, up to $500 a semester for books. And then they have what's called basic allowance for housing. It's more or less just money to live on. Uh, one of the biggest misconceptions that most people have is that everybody in the Air Force is a pilot. Uh, actually, 4% of the Air Force are pilots. A lot of the Air Force doesn't fly. Uh, we have over 100, uh, 150 different jobs in the Air Force, um, ranging from mechanical, electrical, administrative, personnel, uh, all sorts of jobs. I love the Air Force because it gives me a sense of pride uh, to serve our country. Um, it, you know, and with this too, also it, it gives me the opportunity to help other people serve their country and help them become better people. Well, today we're going to talk with some special guests about scouting activities, and there are plenty of things going on in the region, and we have our special guests. We have Ted Kruger, who is here as a scout leader, and his three boys who are involved in scouting. We have Nate, Cam, and Blaine. Thank you so much, guys, for coming in. You're welcome. So, all right, well, let's start with you. You are a scout leader. Give us a little history of what scouting is. 
Um, what scouting is, it's an organization for boys um, from first grade all the way up through their 18th birthday um, that teaches them basically how to be good people, how to be productive members of society, you know, all the right from wrong and all the fun things about how to be a boy too. So. Okay, great. Now tell us a little bit about which boys are eligible and you mentioned a little bit about the age criteria. Yep, any, any boy um, from first grade uh, through on high school up to 18 is eligible to be in Boy Scouts. Um, first grade through fifth grade would be part of Cub Scouts and partway through fifth grade you transition into Boy Scouts. Okay, and that is identified by the difference in their uniforms here, yes, right? Yes, it is. All right. So, Nate, tell us a little bit about how long you've been in Boy Scouts. Well, I started when I was in first grade, and um, my dad was involved in it when he was a kid, and that's he signed me up, and I enjoyed it. And it was just a lot of fun for me to do all of the stuff that they taught me and all the stuff that they showed me how to do. And then... Last year, I transferred over into Boy Scouts, and it opened up an entirely new world to me. Instead of just being able to do one or two campouts a year, I was doing campouts every other month. Wow. And it just taught me so much on what I do now. Uh, it's just a great experience for me. And how many other boys are in your, is it a troop? Or tell us how the structure works a little bit. How many well, guys do you have? I think we have about 12 okay. in our troop, and we have two patrols. It's basically half and half. There's a lightning patrol, which is um, six boys, and then you have a leader of that patrol, and you have an assistant leader of that patrol, and then there's a cobra patrol, which is the same thing, and it's the boys run everything. They plan stuff. Um, Right now we're planning a trip to the Boundary Waters, and the boys will run the meeting, and if the meeting doesn't get done on time, then it's their fault. But they always are doing the stuff themselves. There's a lot of freedom. Okay, so the leaders are there maybe more for just advice at that level? They're there to make sure that no one is injured, and if they are, they have the ability to drive people there if they need to, and um, they're basically there to take you there and take you back. Okay. Keep them on task and make sure they're getting the things accomplished that they want to do accomplished, but pretty much it's their responsibility to come up with the ideas and the game plans and uh, make things happen. So. Great. Now, it seems like one of the things scouts are known for are all these badges that you guys wear on your uniforms. Pick out one on your shirt and tell us how you earned it, what it was for, and... Well, um, this badge right here on the bottom of the pocket, the blue one, the gold one, is called the blue gold, the arrow of light. It's basically the symbol of transformation over to Boy Scouts from Cub Scouts. It's one of the highest badges you can earn besides the Eagle Scout. Um, you get it by completing your tiger cub badge, your bear cub badge, your wolf cub badge, and your weeblo badge. And um, um, you do all these things to complete it. And when you do, there's a big ceremony. And you, you really have to have the courage to stick through it um, the entire time. Because there's a lot of people that are doing sports that don't have time for scouts. Mm -hmm. but. Scouts will teach you a whole lot more than how to throw a ball. And it just basically means that you are no longer elementary. You're getting into the final stages. You're getting ready to get the Eagle Badge. Okay. Very good. Sounds like a lot of work. Sounds like it a lot is, of work. It is, but it's a lot of fun. Good. Now, Cam, we were talking earlier about the different levels of Scouts. Your uniform is a little bit different than your brother's. Can you tell us a little bit about um, why you're dressed differently? One, um, I, this is my third year in it. I had to complete my tiger, my wolf, and I had to earn tiger and bobcat together, and that's basically, I have weeblos, and weeblo too, to go until I'm in Boy Scouts, and then I can go to Camp Cayuna. Okay, and you are still a Cub Scout, right? Mm -hmm. And your brother is as well? Okay. Yeah. 
Right. And you guys have different ties. Can you tell us a little bit about why your ties are different? Um, the, each one has a picture on the back and a different color. And they, mine, Blaine's, it has a picture of a wolf, like, right here. Um, it has that picture, only the little yellow. Blaine used to have one of these, and I used to have one of those. And now I have a bear, a picture of a bear. Okay. And tell me, what, what do you like best about being a Cub Scout? Well, probably camping. All right. And what happens when you go camping? Oh, we have a bunch of fun things, like one of the favorite things in one of the camps is BB gun shooting. Everybody loves that, and archery, slingshot, not everybody's good at, but some people can knock off tin cans and all that. And how often do you get to go camping? Well, we get to do it, like, depending on how much money we have and how much popcorn we sell. Oh, okay. So tell us a little bit about the business end of this organization. You do fundraisers? Um, yes, we sell popcorn. We have kettle corn. We have butter light. And I forgot the other name of it, of the red one, but I'm just going to forget that one. And we have a few large ones and all that. We have a bunch of popcorn. All right. Now, Ted, what, what does the organization hope these young men will learn as they go through the program and ultimately get to something like Eagle, Eagle Scouts, which is a, really a, quite an honor? Well, I guess starting out, we just we teach them the fundamentals of uh, how to treat people, um, how to respect people and property and um, each other. Um, and as they grow, they start to throw a few more things in there towards the leadership skills and how to get along with uh, you know, other people within your community, how to give back to the community. Um, at various times, you've probably seen scouts out doing different projects, and it's one of the big things we teach them. When they get up into the Boy Scouts, um, that's when they're starting to learn how to put all of these things together. So um, by the time they are in high school and through high school, they've already done a lot of project-related stuff that normal kids won't have an, a chance to do. And so mm -hmm. through the leadership and the, uh, the other skills, we're hoping that, you know, they're, they're going to turn out very, very well-rounded. Great. Nate, you mentioned that sometimes kids who get involved in sports don't always have active, don't have the time to stay active in scouts. Can you tell us a little bit about what time commitment is involved? I mean, how much time do you spend with, with the club? Um, well, in Cub Scouts, I think you meet every month, like once a month or twice a month. Um, but in Boy Scouts, you will meet every Monday. And um, it's a big commitment because you have to be ready to sell popcorn to get money so you can do all the fun things that are involved in scouting. You have to help out with the community, which is a big part of scouts. And I think everybody in our troop right now, if we told that our hours to hold together, we would be well over 50 hours total. And it's always looking for time. And when you're in sports, you sort of have to choose between sports and scouts. And if you are able to like, work out Maybe if sports happens to land on a Monday, you can go to one sports practice or, and then a scout yeah. or see if you can make it there even if you're late. Um, it's, it's pretty flexible. Um, it is a time commitment the older you get, but mm -hmm. there, there is the flexibility um, that you can do both if you choose to, and that's one of the other things that they learn is you have to prioritize. You know, sure. As you grow up, there isn't time for just one thing, and so um, it's something that they get older, um, they kind of have to put a value on different things. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it helps them out quite a bit, I think, in that. And merit badges that are also involved in Scouts, that takes a lot of time because some of them it takes you three months minimum to complete it because you have to do so many tasks and you have to uh, do organizational skills like track how well you're doing in a certain area for three months and then record your data again. And it's that's probably one of the biggest time commitments ever that you'll make. Um, Is there a particular merit badge you're working on right now? I am working on quite a few, actually. I was doing personal management, which is financing. And um, I was also um, going to start the golf merit badge. And we're doing aviation merit badge um, this week, actually, or this weekend. And we're going to go to a scout camp 
over in Albert Lee, and we're going to do a lot of things with the aircraft over there. Wow, sounds exciting. Let's talk a little bit about Eagle Scouts, because I'm assuming that's a step, sounds like, that is headed your way. What's involved in becoming an Eagle Scout, and really how many, I mean, that makes the news, how many Scouts actually achieve that level? Eagle Scout is the highest rank that you can achieve within Boy Scouts and uh, a relatively small number of, of boys actually make it to that because there, there's a lot of work involved with it. Up to Eagle Scouts, it, it, you can put in as much time as you really want to and kind of get out of it what you put into it. The people that have chosen to do the Eagle Scout, um, there are a certain number of badges that they're required to get. Um, some of them that are specific to the Eagle Scout trail, others just as uh, badges that, that you get to choose on your own. and. Um, Leading up to that, you have certain points that you have to hit along the way. Um, once you're preparing for the Eagle Scout itself, you pick a, a service project, and you have to organize everything around this project. You have to get the volunteers for it. You have to line up pretty much everything with it and act out this project and do it. And the project itself is supposed to give something back to the community or is supposed to help in some way. Okay. And it's supposed to be something that lasts and, and will be out there for, for quite some time. And when you finish all of this, you have an application process you have to go through where you've documented all of your merit badges you've got, your project that you've done, the community service hours that you've had to put in, and that actually gets sent off. And uh, you have to go through a review process with the board. Um, the council itself has to review it. And then, you know, if you've passed all that, then you get awarded your Eagle badge. So it's a pretty lengthy process. Pretty but the people that have achieved that, um, have done very well. Uh, it's, with all of the skills they've been taught, it's, it's really helped them out in their life. So. Now it sounds like you were a Boy Scout? I up. actually was only a Cub Scout. I did was not actually Cub transition Scout? into Boy oh, okay. Scouts. All but right. uh, but you're familiar with the organization from your childhood and you've seen what your boys have gone through. How has the organization changed? I mean, sometimes we think of Boy Scouts as simply camping out in the woods and learning how to build a fire. It sounds like there's much more to it these days. There is. It, uh, the core fundamentals are still there and we still teach them all about being a boy, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, as the culture has changed, they're they're learning the things that uh, we do today. You know, the computer skills and um, some of the things with technology as as that evolves and merit badges will reflect that. It's not just archery and mm -hmm. and things like that anymore. You're getting into web design and wow. um, communications. You know, so it changes with with the whole culture with the and times. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, say Cam, is there any particular badge that you are working on right now as you um. The bear badge, um, but we have to go through a whole bunch of other bear bad, um, badges before you get the bear badge. And so it'll just be like an adding to your collection of badges. And so you can tr achieve more and become closer to being a Boy Scout like my brother Nate. I see you've got a very colorful one on your left shoulder that's similar to your brother's as well. What, what's that badge oh, for? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is stands for the Twin Valley Council. Council. Anybody in the Twin Valley Council um, gets this one, and whatever council they're in or anything can go right here as long as, well, I don't know what other uniforms they use, but I'm just pretty sure that everybody in PAC 113 um, get this Twin Valley one. All right, and a great segue to our close. For those of you who are out there and are interested in Boy Scouts, the Twin Valley Council is located out of Mankato. Mankato. Uh, and there are other Boy Scout councils in the region. I, I'm assuming there's a geographic territory That's correct. for each one. Yes. All right, so if any, anyone is interested in, in more information about the Boy Scouts, you certainly can check out the Mankato organization, which is the Twin Valley Boy Scout Council. I thank all of you for coming in to visit with us about Boy Scouts. Thank you very much. Sounds like you're having a great time. Yes. All right. Stay tuned for more Cities on the Move. Meet Mayor Ted Radke. Ted has been the mayor of Hollandale, Minnesota for 19 years. He and his wife, Bertie, and their daughter, Megan, now grown, moved to Hollandale from Byron, Minnesota. As Mayor, Ted recently presided over the opening of a new government center, which also houses Riceland Township Hall. He enjoys living in Hollandale because of the good neighbors who care. When he was a child, Ted thought he would grow up to be a farmer. He's right at home in this farming community. The Quarry Hill Nature Center is chock full of experiences that will give you a greater understanding of nature. Let's check out this great local resource. Tucked into the hillside of the east side of Rochester is an area gem, the Quarry Hill Nature Center. 
Established in the 1970s by science teachers, this Rochester City Park has much to offer. Executive Director Roberta Tolan explains the mission of the center. Our mission is opening eyes and minds through natural science discovery. And what that means is looking at the youth, families, and adults of this area and helping them enjoy, understand, and make good decisions in their life that affect the natural world. Getting excited, being outdoors, being healthy, and understanding how we as humans affect the natural world and, and how we interact. The interesting history of the property results in some unusual attractions for visitors. This grounds used to be part of the state hospital and it was used, they had a, um, a garden where they were basically self-sufficient and they, had, they grew all of what they ate. But they, um, before refrigeration, they had to have a cool place to put it. So they actually dug a cave, a man-made cave that's still on the premises um, where they stored all the vegetables and fruit for consumption. And we do tours of that man-made cave, which is really interesting. We also have a quarry that was functional during that time as well and we now use part of that for rock climbing. So there's a lot of different things outdoors. Included in the 320 acres are additional outdoor activities, as well as interpretive exhibits and programs in the center. So we have both paved and unpaved hiking trails. So whether it's walking, walking your dog, running, hiking, all of that's available here. During the winter, we also offer skiing. Uh, we have ski trails and we rent skis and snowshoes. So outdoors, all of the um, environment is for use and enjoyment. We have an acre and a half pond where we have it stocked by the uh, Department of Natural Resources. So they stock the pond every spring. So we have fishing and we offer through some of our classes, canoeing and kayaking, um, just understanding and learning about the bird life and the animal life that fit into an aquatic system. Here we have a lot of an, an exhibit hall that has freshwater fish, um, different animals and species that are native to Minnesota in the area. The extensive facilities are complemented by the Quarry Hill Nature Center staff. Kirk Payne is a teacher naturalist who shares his love of wild creatures. Here at Quarry Hill, a lot of people do come to see birds and some of the more common native birds that they'll see in the park are black-capped chickadees, uh, blue jays, uh, downy woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers. Uh, some of the species change from season to season and just in the last few weeks the first dark-eyed juncos, a northern bird that spends its winters in the Midwest, uh, those birds have begun arriving from northern Minnesota and Canada. We do have deer, uh, there are red fox that den and raise young in the park each year, quite a few raccoons, again we rarely see them but if you take a walk by the pond you'll find their tracks in the mud. Uh, we have possums, skunks, uh, and certainly uh, a lot of squirrels. Reptiles are one of the groups of animals that people enjoy coming to see here at the Nature Center. Um, we have quite a few snakes on display and one of the reasons uh, we enjoy uh, displaying those uh, animals is that they're great interpretive uh, teaching tools. A lot of people enjoy coming to see the turtles. We, uh, we have 10 uh, turtle species found in Minnesota and we have most of those on display here. A few birds on display, an owl, uh, a small falcon. Uh, we've got a lot of things kids can handle. We have touch tables. Many of these exhibits are used in the extensive programming coordinated by Sue Shockey. We do a lot of programs for school groups, so that's the bulk of our programming. But we also do programming for um, everything from toddlers through adults. We do parent-child classes for preschool age kids. We do after school programming. Um, some programs for families and then adult programs. So all of them kind of focus on getting outside, enjoying nature, and learning some science. With the wide variety of activities, the Quarry Hill Nature Center tempts you into the great outdoors. One of the wonderful things about all nature centers, and particularly Quarry Hill Nature Center, is the importance right now almost more important than any other time that I can think of certainly is the importance of getting people outdoors. We have more and more uh, health issues and weight issues and things and I think the more time we spend outdoors in a healthy environment the better our lives are going to be in general. So I think here at Quarry Hill we contribute to that uh, positive part of people's lives. For more information about the Quarry Hill Nature Center visit them online at qhnc.org. Keeping the region on the move outdoors. Cities on the Move is on the web. Make a comment, ask a question, or share your good idea by visiting our website at 
ksmq.org. Well, there are so many fun things to do around the region. Here are just a few that you may want to consider. On November 21st, the second annual Mankato's Chili Fest will support two great organizations, the Minnesota Rett Syndrome Research Association and the Mankato Veterans Memorial Place. Enjoy music, a silent auction, beanbag tournament, and of course, great chili. Tickets are $5. For more information, visit MankatoChiliFest.com. And for those of you looking forward to our interview next week with Scandinavian collector Sonia Anderson, you may be interested in the Norwegian Christmas Weekend hosted by the Vesterheim Museum in Decorah, Iowa on December 5th and 6th. A lively event that appeals to all ages, the Norwegian Christmas Weekend features folk art demonstrations, live music, a book signing, Scandinavian food, and many holiday traditions, both old and new. Enjoy the classic Cinderella at the Stebbins Children's Theatre December 2nd through the 13th in Mason City, Iowa. This enchanting tale is retold as a classic English pantomime. The two nasty stepsisters are only overshadowed by the truly cruel stepmother. Then late one night, who should appear but a fairy godmother, and Cinderella is magically swept away to her prince charming at the ball. For ticket information, check out Stebbins.com. If you have an event you'd like to share with our viewers, log on to our website, ksmq.org, and post your information today. Cities on the Move is on the web. Make a comment, ask a question, or share your good idea by visiting our website at ksmq.org. Next week on Cities on the Move, we'll learn about the proposed changes in the U.S. Postal Service with Larry Bach. We'll also meet Sonia Anderson, an advocate of all things Scandinavian. Please join us Tuesday, November 17th at 6.30 p.m. on KSMQ for another edition of Cities on the Move. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Good night. Production of this program is made possible in part through a grant from the Blandon Foundation.